I realized this morning that tomorrow is the 12th anniversary of my ordination on these very steps. Some of the people in this room laid hands on me that day, so it is good to be home. I spent a lot of years sitting on the first pew here. We liked to say that it was uh, so that we could see Dad sitting in the choir. Mostly, I think it was that we were on Owen Standard Time, which is about 10 minutes late. And in a Presbyterian crowd, you can always guarantee that the front row is available. Pat shared this morning that I was baptized, confirmed, ordained, and married in this congregation and uh, at our rehearsal for our wedding. One of the pastors said, you know, the only ritual you have left to do in the church is a funeral. So instead of a funeral, which I hope is a lot of years from now, how about we gather around God's word together? Yes? The second scripture lesson for this morning comes from the prophet Isaiah, the 43rd chapter, the first seven verses. So listen now for the word of God. But now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. I give people in return for your life, nations in exchange for you. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you up. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from far away and my daughters from the end of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, who I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Come, Holy Spirit, heavenly dove, with all thy quickening power. Come shed abroad a Savior's love that it may kindle ours. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Have you ever had to walk into a room where you don't know anyone all by yourself? Anybody? It's terrifying, right? I'm an extrovert who, much like my mom, can talk to nearly anyone, and it's terrifying. And it doesn't matter whether it's the middle school lunchroom or a wedding or a retirement party. There is a kind of universal dread of feeling alone in a room full of people. You go through all the questions in your head, right? What should I say? Who should I talk to? What do I do with my hands? Are there customs that I don't know about in this group of people? And most importantly, am I about to make a fool out of myself? I had the joy this morning of walking back into this sanctuary, this place that I call home. But maybe you're here this morning visiting for the very first time, and you were brave enough to walk into this sanctuary, and you don't know anybody. If you did, welcome. You've walked into a room full of people for whom everyone at some point was in your shoes. And I hope that no matter who you are, you have been warmly greeted, and that you don't go too long feeling alone. When I'm feeling anxious, what I want more than anything is that assurance that I am not alone. We, as humans, are made to be in relationship. 
By our very nature, humans are communal people, which is probably why feeling alone or on the outside or disconnected feels so scary. When faced with these social situations, our natural tendency is to go with someone or to find someone, to convince someone to go with us. Maybe you've asked somebody to be your wingman to a party or your plus one at a wedding. If your kid went to camp this summer, that anxiety of a new adventure is eased dramatically if you have a buddy to go with. And any of you who have been to the doctor for a medical procedure know that they often won't even let you show up alone, right? That sweet front desk clerk that hands you the clipboard that you've already filled out online says, and who's here with you? Who will be driving you home? Even for a simple adventure, like going on a hike, you look for a buddy. The ranger sign at the beginning of every trailhead says, do not hike alone. I hear the National Parks Service posted one this summer that said, hike in groups. You don't have to be faster than the bear, just faster than your friend. But we seek comfort and reassurance in community with friends when challenges come our way. And when we lack that sense of community, we feel lost. And that's how the Israelites were feeling in today's scripture passage. Their situation wasn't about a party or a summer camp. Israel was experiencing exile, a kind of displacement from everything that they knew and loved. And they not only felt isolated from each other, but they felt rejected and forgotten by God. The chapter that precedes today's scripture reading, chapter 42, puts it rather bleakly. And an Old Testament scholar, Dr. Portia Young, summarizes it this way. She says, forsaken, brutalized, and conquered, God's people became prisoners in foreign lands where no one, not even God, would claim them. No one would speak for them and say, they are mine, give them back to me, free my people. Israel had been scattered from everything that they knew as home and lost their sense of community. And the prophet Isaiah was tasked with declaring that their disobedience was in part to blame. So they were not having a very good day. And they felt alone. But into this bleak situation, this sense of isolation, God speaks something fresh through this very same prophet. This morning's scripture reading begins, but now, God says. But now serves as this kind of pivot point into something new. And the God who has felt far off and silent and even judgmental speaks a fresh new word. And what pours forth this time is not judgment, but a kind of love letter to God's people. God says, for all those moments that you felt alone, I never forgot you. I created you, O Jacob. I formed you, O Israel. You are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. I have called you by name. You are mine. But of all the beautiful language in this love poem from God, the most powerful word, in my opinion, in the whole reading is this very small word, a preposition, with. Do not fear, for I am with you. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. You see, God doesn't love us at a distance or care about us from arm's length. God's love stretches down to be with us. The God who we thought was very far off is actually right beside us. You, O Israel, you, my loved ones, you are never alone. Now, I will admit that in school, I absolutely hated learning to diagram sentences. I don't even know if they make you do that in school anymore, but Mrs. Clark back in fifth grade did. She made us learn all of the parts of speech, subject, verb, and object, and each week we would add in a new part of speech. 
conjunctions, prepositions, and so on. So you'd start with, I eat, and then I eat pizza, and then I eat pizza with Susie. And somewhere in these painstaking grammar lessons, you learn that prepositions are actually crucial because prepositions are connectors. They serve to link and connect ideas and people and objects and places together. Without prepositions, you can run, but not in any particular direction. Without prepositions, you can act, but not with anyone. And so Isaiah's use of the preposition with sets the Israelites on a new path with a new or renewed connection. Because God could have said through the prophet Isaiah, do not fear for I am. And that would be true. We know God whose name is Yahweh. His name was given to Moses and it means the great I am. Maybe all God's people needed was to remember that God was and is and is to come. God is. But God didn't say that. God says, do not fear, for I am with you. You see, it isn't enough to know that God is. What matters is to know that God is with Israel. What matters is to know that God is with you and you and you and me. We often talk about a God of covenant, a God who makes and keeps promises, a God who doesn't need humanity, but who chooses to be with us despite our screw-ups and failings and sin. The Israelites had broken this covenant and disobeyed God, and they were living out the consequences of that severed relationship in exile, and Isaiah, as a prophet, had been called to speak truth to Israel, to speak truth in light of their disobedience And if you have read a lot of Isaiah, you know that it is not always good news. But a severed relationship doesn't matter if the two parties don't care about each other. And so Isaiah 43 is this reminder of how much God cares and loves and desires to be with us no matter what. God is not just some amorphous being out there. God is right here next to us, with us in love. I love the story of Ignacy Paderewski. He's a Polish famous concert pianist. And the story goes that a mom had brought her young son, who was just learning to take piano lessons, to one of Paderewski's concerts. And the mother was standing there talking to a friend, and as she was, her son slipped away, and as the stage lights came on and the concert lights um, or the room lights dimmed, the mom looked up and noticed that her son was seated at the piano. And not sure what else to do, her son began playing the one song he had learned thus far, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. And his mother's sitting out there gasping in horror. And the concert pianist, Paderewski, appeared on stage and quickly moved to the piano and whispered to the boy, don't stop, keep playing. And Paderewski reached down with his left hand and added a bass line. And then he reached around the boy with his right hand and added an obligato on the top. And the old master and the young novice held the crowd mesmerized, by their unlikely improvisation. The boy was no longer alone. That's what God is doing here. Showing up to be with, to accompany, to promise again to reach God's arms around us and help us remember the love song that binds us together with God. And with that embrace... Israel and we can trust that we are not alone. In my first call as a pastor, I was a campus minister at Duke University in North Carolina. And of all the mission opportunities that I introduced my students to, one of the most important ones came through a partnership with a group called the Religious Coalition for a Nonviolent Durham. 
Durham had a long history of violence, and this particular group formed to address the pain that this community was feeling. And their ministry began not with protests, and not with political action, but with prayer vigils. The tagline for the vigils was simple. Show up, know nothing, expect healing. So every time a homicide occurred in the city, a prayer vigil was scheduled in honor of the person who had been killed at the site of the incident, and people gathered to pray for an end of violence and a transformation of the city. And the victims' families were invited to come if they wanted. The neighbors and neighborhood were invited, and those from the community gathered. And it was simple. We gathered in a circle and lit a candle and said a prayer. The whole thing typically lasted no more than 30 minutes. Now, you could argue that such an action is pointless. It didn't change the fact that a life had been lost. It didn't change the brokenness that was all around, but it mattered deeply that in the midst of pain and disorientation, someone was there to be with the survivors. And what has grown out of the Religious Coalition's work is a dramatic transformation of the city toward justice and healing in the lives of the victims' families and the city as a whole. But that transformation was only possible because the community trusted that they were not alone. God was with them in the faces of community members who showed up in love as if God was wrapping God's arms around them, accompanying them through a time of trial. Do not fear, for I am with you, says the Lord. It's really good news. And it's even better news when the with takes on hands and feet that walk alongside us. Of course, the greatest example of this that we have is in God's Son. Jesus literally embodies the prepositions in his life. We call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And he shows us the way to that ministry of accompaniment, of being with by walking alongside the ostracized and marginalized and outcast and untouchable, and sometimes it was nothing more than his simple presence, his witness of love that transforms those who had been cast aside or judged from afar. And so it is interesting, and probably no accident, that the resurrected Christ, in his final words in Matthew's gospel, his great commission, that he would end by saying, Remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The God who has been with us from the beginning, who walked alongside us as Emmanuel, will be with us to the end, Jesus says. But that promise is tied to an invitation and a call and a responsibility for each of us. You heard it in this morning's reading from Matthew. Christ calls us to go and make disciples, baptizing them like you will next week, baptizing them and teaching them all that Jesus has taught. It is the core call of the church. You did it for me. And for so many others in this very room. But what happens at that font is not some kind of magical moment that disappears when the water dries. The journey begins at the font. But it comes to life only when the church takes seriously the harder but more joyful and more meaningful work of embodying the preposition of being with. I can attest that I am standing here as an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church because of the many ways that you were with me growing up. I'm here because you were with me in Willard Hall for Vacation Bible School when Connie Bear and Claudia Perney taught me all of those songs that we can still sing. I'm here because many of you went with me on mission trips as a youth and tolerated a lot of hours in a very smelly church van. 
I'm here because people like Pat and others slept on a lot of church floors all across this presbytery for church retreats. You were the presence of God for me when I left for college through saints like Rachel Fagan, who wrote me a letter every month for four years that was a weather report in Topeka and a report on whether my mom showed up to fold the bulletin that week. You were the presence of God when I went off to seminary through many, many prayers and saints like Barb Stanley, who drove all over this presbytery to some rather onerous meetings to get me through the ordination process. You fulfilled your baptismal promises that you made to me so that I could know and trust that the God made known in Jesus Christ is with me always. But that work is never done. The church is always called to carry forth those promises to each other. And you don't know what child in this church today may be called to lead simply because you helped them to know and trust that God is with them. What I know for sure is that the promise of Christ, the promise of God made known in Isaiah is true. Remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Thanks be to God. Amen.